evolution and the Bible are enemies. The theory that all living things have gradually developed from simpler forms over millions of years by natural processes and the stark record of Genesis that they were the result of creative acts over six days by God are totally incompatible. The rise in popularity of evolution since the publication of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin in 1859 has been accompanied by a decline in acceptance of the Bible as the Word of God and an ever-accelerating trend to discard its moral standards. In recent times evolution has become the accepted norm of the masses. Whereas the Bible has been relegated to the position of a ceremonial appendage to a generally hypocritical society. Various forms of theistic evolution have been suggested in which the creator is reduced to a minor influence behind the process of natural selection. But to reconcile the Bible with evolution necessitates the wholesale mutilation of the Genesis narrative. To accommodate the enormous time spans in the plainly recorded six days and to explain in terms of gradual development from ape-like and even more primitive creatures. Man's direct special creation from the dust of the ground is a unique creature in the image of God. Involves feats of literary and intellectual gymnastics that are less than honest. If evolution is true, then Moses' account of the origin of species must be fictitious. In the editorial introduction of the National Geographic for November 1985, which is devoted to the evolution of man, Wilbur Garrett compares evolutionary theory with the attempt of Archbishop Usher in the 1650s to arrive at a Bible-based chronology of the world, he writes. He could not have imagined the number and intensity of the arguments his dates would generate between those fundamentalists who accept the story of Genesis literally and equally devout people who regard it as figurative. Ironically the Bible is lost in these debates, since nowhere does it attempt to date the universe. I like to think that Bishop did the best he could with the facts at hand. I also like to think that, if he were to come back today, he would be fascinated by the tremendous advances in scholarship in just three centuries, and not too offended that his dates were a bit conservative. The universe we know today, billions of years old, populated with almost incomprehensibly complex life forms. Programmed with astonishingly clever plans for heredity, change and survival, might inspire in him, as it does in so many other people of faith today, even greater respect and devotion for the creator. So with a single word, figurative, Garrett passes over the gulf that exists between the Bible account and evolution. His magazine contains no endeavor to explain how Moses' words can be regarded as figurative, and notwithstanding his claim for faith in a creator by so many, the hard uncomfortable fact remains that the belief of millions more has been destroyed by the scholarship he admires. Can he not assume that his readers go one step further and conclude that the creator in the Bible is figurative also? But Garrett's editorial is useful in two respects. In singling out the Hebrew account of creation for mention, it unintentionally acknowledges it as the strongest opposition against evolutionary theory than the legends that exist on the origin of the world which have emanated from other nations. In addition, his use of words like programmed and astonishingly clever testifies to the inescapable logic that the design so evident in nature necessitates the genius of a designer behind it. It is important to recognize that the Genesis record is an integral part of the whole Bible, being the foundation upon which its message is built. Those familiar with the Hebrew and Greek scriptures will be aware of many points of interdependence, some of the obvious ones being Moses' record of the law of the Sabbath day in the weekly cycle, written by the hand of God in the Ten Commandments, clearly mentioning that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Jesus' quotation of the creation and marriage of the first man and woman. And Paul's reference to the deception of the woman by the serpent. Destroy the factual account of creation and the superstructure is undermined to the point of collapse. Furthermore the transformation of the creative acts into figurative concepts also destroys the Bible, since there can be no limit to the application of this technique to any part of it. Indeed many have already gone far in this direction, the clergy well represented among them, turning plain statements on such things as the resurrection of Christ, 
the restoration of the Jews to their land and the millennial reign of Christ from Jerusalem into meaningless fantasies. The Bible and evolution then are hostile to each other and attempts to find common ground between them must logically lead to denial of them both. Admit the claims of evolution and you remove the basis for belief in God. A meaning to life. Fixed standards of morality and hope for the future. Nothing remains but the shifting sands of pseudoscientific speculation and the changing winds of chance. This is the fundamental issue that confronts us. It pushes us to consider the factual evidence on both sides. But before reviewing the basis for evolution's claims, the point should be made that, while the Bible and evolution are incompatible, the Bible and true science aren't. By true science I mean the system of knowledge and understanding of the universe, based on observations and experiments that are factual, consistent, and repeatable. On the one hand we have the Bible, which is not a textbook on biology, but which does contain information that impinges upon this subject. On the other we have science, which contains both factual information and deductive laws that provide systematic explanations of some of the facts. It will be shown that, when fairly interpreted, science is in harmony with the Bible, wherever their paths meet. And that evolution is an illogical hypothesis that agrees with neither. After over a century and a half of research, investigation, and debate, Darwinian evolution remains today, essentially what it was at the beginning, a speculative hypothesis not capable of demonstration or verification and inconsistent with several fundamental laws of science. Darwin could not find an explanation for the origin of life, but had to rely upon the existence of a first cause, that is, a creator. To bring into existence primeval living things upon which evolution could operate, he says. To my mind, it accords better with what we know of the laws impressed on matter by the creator. That the production and extinction of the past and present inhabitants of the world should have been due to secondary causes. I view all beings not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of some few beings which lived long before the first bed of the Cambrian system was deposited. But Darwin's appeal to the laws impressed on matter is ironical indeed, in view of the fact that the laws of genetics, which have been progressively elucidated after his time, have virtually disproved the inheritance of the effects of the use and disuse of parts and of characteristics acquired from environmental conditions. Factors which were implicit in his mechanism for evolution. Neo-Darwinism sees natural selection as left to work only with variations arising from chance mutations, variations that are detrimental to the organism in virtually all cases, if artificial selection is excluded. Yet even Darwin found it difficult to believe, let alone explain, how the complex structures of living things could be produced without supernatural intervention, he says. Nothing at first can appear more difficult to believe than that the more complex organs and instincts have been perfected by the accumulation of innumerable slight variations, each good for the individual possessor. Nevertheless, this difficulty, though appearing to our imagination insuperably great, cannot be considered real. It is, no doubt, extremely difficult even to conjecture by what gradations many structures have been perfected. Another conflict of Darwin's theory with the laws impressed on matter is seen in the realm of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics has to do with the conservation of energy and matter, which cannot be destroyed, but only converted from one form to another. The second law states that, in the physical world, there is a continual tendency towards greater randomness and disorder, and less differentiation. In explanation of this law, the universe can be likened to a clock that is wound up having a tendency to run down, thereby converting into low-grade heat by means of friction and sound waves, the mechanical energy stored in the spring. Evolution proposes that in the biological world the second law not only does not apply, but that it operates in reverse, simpler, less differentiated and less complex organisms producing more complex creatures by accidental events. To use the same analogy, this is equivalent to the clock winding itself up using heat extracted from itself and its surroundings. Evolutionists have not proposed any satisfactory explanation for this insuperable difficulty. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to get notifications of new videos. Like, share and comment below.